Okay, hello everybody. Um, I want to talk to you about uh, a map that I have been studying intensively the last uh, five years. It's already in my life uh, for 10 years. And how I use this map as a uh, tool for data, uh, for research and communication on past, present and uh, future landscapes. Or in a more theoretical uh, framework, if you like, uh, I will be talking about uh, how transmission of maps and also the cons consumption and reconsumption of maps um, uh, has been done here, rather than the production of maps, of which I've been talking on on, on different talks uh, beforehand. Eh? Because, uh, as we will see in this map, uh, in this presentation, the transmission of maps, especially this one, has been changed throughout the life. So it's the map of Peter Purbus. I will go into detail uh, immediately, but what I want to say here is that it's changed somehow functions throughout its life. First, it was made by uh, the Liberty of Bruges, which was a Viscounty, uh, to map the jurisdiction of uh, its territory. Uh, and it had a very large, uh, very important uh, some symbolic function also. Right? And it's probably this, it was a large wall map, uh, Italian style. Um, and this, this uh, symbolic function is probably the reason why it disappeared in the French period, the French occupation uh, by Napoleon. Um, and then it reappeared from an attic in the beginning of the 20th century, and then it went straight into the Fine Arts uh, Museum. And literally, it functioned from that moment onwards as a just a pretty picture. Um, until, of course, uh, I started uh, my research. And in my research, I used the map on very different ways, as a, a treasure map, as a story map, and as a road map. And that will be the framework of this talk but let's first start with a short introduction of the map itself, of course. Um, the map, as you can see it here, is depicting an area on the border of today's uh, Netherlands and uh, Belgium, largest part in, in Belgium. And uh, in medieval period and in the 16th century, this region was uh, uh, connected in the county of Flanders, which was a, one of the most important counties in Northwestern Europe at that moment. And the, the Liberty of Rouge was actually part of this county, so a Visconti uh, of uh, this area. And uh, the Liberty, they ordered the map and they wanted to have a map that had um, that, that showed the border of the entire Liberty uh, of, the, of the jurisdiction. And as much as possible also on the map, they wanted the roads, the waters, the bridges, the villages and the cities. So it was ordered in or commissioned in 1561. And Peter Kurbus did uh, 10 years on making the map. As you can see, it's a pretty large map. There's a reproduction here, and I think that's more or less one quarter of the, uh, of the, of the map in, in, in real. Uh, and a combination, of course, with uh, a lot of, with this large uh, scale. This uh, combination of those three factors is already uh, makes the map a quite unique uh, manuscript map. Uh, so it's depicting a very large area, more or less 700 square kilometers in very large detail, as you can see on this map. Eh? So uh, this um, picture is not only showing, you can here see the scale down, uh, showing the level of detail. So the church of this little village is painted within one centimeter, but also the media that it was used. It was oil paint on canvas. And here on the coat of arms, you can clearly see that the paint flakes are coming off and you, see, you can see the canvas uh, underneath coming through. So the state of preservation is not that well. So I used it, uh, first of all, as a uh, treasure map. Eh? That was the main objective of my research, because as I said, um, the map was predominantly used as a pretty picture, but no one really looked into the content, the topographic content of the map. And if we, by simply georeferencing it, this is a dumb little village just out of sight of Bruges. You can already see that the main topographic features, that is the, the um, roads, for example, and the canals, don't mind the big 19th century canals, but for example, this one, this one, to Ghent, you can clearly see that there is a nice overlay of the today's topography and the features that we have on the 16th century uh, map. So first stop in evaluating the topographic accuracy is a vectorization that I did. Uh, for example, we identified more than uh, 300 place names, not all are readable. Lots of kilometers of dike, which is painted in white, and uh, regular road, which is painted in uh, red. And more than 8,000 houses are uh, uh, factorized, identified. 
So uh, next step was to really evaluate all those things that were depicted. Is there, is there a topographic and a historical reality or is it was the, just the imagination of a very good painter? Uh, let me take you to uh, one of the case studies that I did. It's a case study on the left bank of this Zwin Tidal Inlet, which was connected to medieval uh, Bruges. And it's uh, an area right in between the dunes here and the other side, the coastal wetlands. And uh, it's right in between. And what we see there is a depiction of two little hillocks, one here, one there. This one has three houses on top of it, and it has a place name called uh, Scapri, which is probably interpretation sheep farm. That's the most logical interpretation. Um, from a historical and agricultural point of view, that may, this makes a lot of sense. So we're in the area outside the embankments, so the white lines are the embankments. So we're in that area, and sheep farms could be located there. We don't have any um, examples from that in Belgium anyway. In the Netherlands we have, but not in Belgium, and especially not on uh, this specific location. So uh, the idea was to then check it out uh, if there's really uh, um, archaeology that's left there. Excuse me. First, we checked another uh, historical map. So we're a bit later now. There's a, another embankment. Uh, and you can see this scapri or sheep farm apparently disappeared, but the other one is right there on the specific uh, location. We look at the aerial photographs, nothing seems to be present, but then we look at the LIDAR, so the elevation model, and you can see there popping out a perfect uh, little circle, uh, which is probably exactly located where uh, Purbus draw the, the hillock. If you go to the field, you can see that it's just popping out a little bit, it's 30 centimeters, it's not more, it's very flat landscape. And if you're on top of it, you can even see that the crops are having some difficulties. This is the summer of 2019. It's potato crop. And it was right on top of the hillock. It was a bit more sandy. And it was uh, the drought caused some problems with the crops. Then we did the geophysical soil scan, electromagnetics uh, on that part. And you can see here on the, on the electric uh, response that there's a white show it. zone is this sandy outcrop. And then now we're looking at the top layer, the, the above 50 centimeters of this of this field. And you can see all these little black spots. These are magnetic reactions. So there's a lot of material lingering around there uh, uh, with magnetic reaction in, in the above 50 centimeters. So we did the field walk uh, survey on this spot. And we picked up every uh, historical relevant, uh, all historical re relevant uh, material. And that's these kinds of things. They're really small fragments of ceramics. And then we also, so we measured them with GPS, every uh, single fragment. And we did uh, a study on, on, the, on the fragments. And what's, what was the result? That there was a clear over-representation of these, we call this rim fragments, eh? clear over-representation of a certain type of vessel. And that was a vessel uh, that was used for uh, milk containers. As you can see here on this image, 16th century miniature drawing, these types of vessels were in mass uh, available on this site. And if you then, of course, look at the, the, um, the drawing as a whole, you can see that this is clearly depicting a sheep uh, farm. Lady is making uh, 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 cheese here and the, the farmer going out with his sheep. So this case study proved that the topographic uh, spots that they were identified that were uh, drawn by the by Peter Purbis on the map show or represent a archaeological reality. That sites and all the other uh, inventory sites are uh, then made available on this uh, online application where you can uh, compare the medieval uh, landscape with today's landscape. You can also uh, then have the uh, the vectors uh, activated and click on the symbols. And actually, it was developed for this touch table application in an exhibit we did on this uh, map. And then the visitors could gather around this multi-touch uh, table and then check out, compare the historical landscape with today's landscape. And then, of course, compare it also with the, the real thing um, behind them. And the good news is that uh, in a few weeks, uh, this uh, map will also feature in uh, the Flemish platform of, of maps. So uh, from that moment onwards, all professionals and amateurs will be able to uh, check the map online 
Uh, and, and from that moment onwards, it can be properly used in, uh, in heritage management. And this example now shows that we don't only, we did not only um, uh, use the map to study the past landscape, but also we put it into practice for present day heritage management, which I think is one of the most important outcomes um, of this research. The story I told about the, the sheep farm, for example, that was also something I wanted to tell to another audience. Eh? So um, next thing I did was also using the map as a uh, platform to tell local stories. But something I noticed in the foregoing years that I did research and gave presentations, that I always had this quite a kind of similar uh, audience. It was, they were interested, as you can see here. <laughs> but the same person is, yeah, it's, it's the typical public for an archaeology or historical cartography uh, presentation. It's, it's white, male, and 60 plus, let's say, like this. Which is, in fact, not that much of a problem. But I thought that my stories that I had to tell also could interest another public. But how do you diversify <laughs> your public? That's always a difficult one in, uh, in, in storytelling. And uh, that's why I combined some different concepts that you, won't not, you would not uh, immediately uh, think of when you talk about science communication. So the first concept was uh, the concept developed by the marketing guys of Tupperware. It's the party plan concept in which uh, host invites its own network, so its neighbors, friends, uh, family, to sell something, plastic boxes in this case. That was an interesting concept, I thought. A similar concept is a living room um, uh, gigs uh, where you have again a host and he invites on the one hand a musician and the other hand his local network to listen to this very intimate concept eh? so that's that the, the idea is that it's here very proximate proximate to the to the artist and it's a very intimate setting on the other hand I had of course this bunch of desktop data that I had to verify on the field so I had to go out on the field for quite a long time and then I also used, I also dropped in my fondness of, of cycling. And uh, let me already have this map box uh, driven um, a map that we will hear about tomorrow already that I recently discovered and is uh, very interesting. Um, this is where I work, the red zone, the red in the heat map where I work and where I live. And this is the area where, uh, where the map is situated. So I combined those things, you see, into the following concept. I have to get out. So the concept was Purbus Troubadour. Uh, during the day, I was um, cycling through the landscape, um, predominantly over medieval roads, that was the idea, and to visit as much sites as possible that I uh, uh, checked earlier. That was during the day. Here you see, for example, uh, the site that I visited, that we saw the Scaperi site. Um, in the evening, I gave living room lectures to hosts uh, that were uh, pre-selected. And in, uh, instead of the, the, me giving the living room lecture, they provided me in board and lodging for one night. That was the concept. Uh, and some practicalities. I had the, the map in a 50-page uh, print on my cockpit. Uh, I also vectorized, of course, the, uh, the vectorized data. I had them in the, in the smartphone, an Osmond application, so I could navigate really on the medieval uh, roads as much as possible. And when I was lost, I used uh, GeoEditor to find my way back in the Middle Ages. In total, I did uh, around uh, uh, more or less 800 kilometers of uh, medieval road. More importantly, of course, I did uh, 13 hosts. I visited 13 hosts uh, where I gave them living room specific um, presentations. So every uh, presentation was, half of it was the general presentation on, on, the, on the project. Half of it was really circling around the living room itself, the square kilometer around the living room there I, I was looking for some stories and also of course the stories came out of the audience while we were talking while we were giving these presentations so from a storytelling point of view 
I think I really managed to increase uh, diversity and also especially increase the impact. Not only, it's especially the proximity, which is important. You're, as a researcher, very close to your, to your audience. Eh? Um, but also um, the proximity of the audience with the, um, with the place where they are living. Eh? They, it evoked really the sense of place, which is an uh, important uh, thing. I also blogged uh, and made this little uh, mini documentary about it because that's the downside of this uh, small scale uh, presentations. Not everyone can join, of course. Uh, so I uh, did this for the wider audience. It has a second part also, the story map, uh, a minor part, but we also included the map in a augmented reality table that we made in another project. This was actually the Lost Ports project that was connected to my PhD. Uh, so with my colleagues of S2 and Timescope, uh, we made this augmented reality table in which the history of the Zwin area, which is this landscape that I study, is told uh, in augmented video of more or less 10 uh, minutes. It's research-based, uh, we go for research interpretation to, in the end, visualization of this uh, older uh, landscape. And also the map of Purbus, of course, featured uh, in this uh, video. It was also used as a base layer for the uh, um, reconstruction of the 16th century uh, landscape time slide in this presentation. I also have a small animation of this, the part where it appears, but um, okay, it's running. Um, as you can see, there's, uh, it's, it's animated. Uh, you have a timeline uh, underneath. Here's the map coming. Um, so, but it, this is really, uh, you might notice, but experiences is, is what's all happening in uh, museums nowadays. Uh, so this is really an experience-based application. So it doesn't work really on a presentation like this. So I all invite you to come to Bruges because it's now permanently available in the city hall in Bruges. Then uh, finally, I also use it as a roadmap. First of all, again, the Lost Ports uh, exhibition, we also had a cycling tour attached to it, a 40 and a 16 uh, kilometers cycling tour. And in this cycling tour, there were four VR boots placed in the landscape where you can see animations like this. Uh, so you're in this specific VR boot and then uh, the castle of the Burgundians was just at that spot. Uh, again, appealing to this uh, sense of uh, place, of course. But where is the map? Well, next to the, the paper map, there was also a web application uh, developed for this uh, cycling tour. And you could switch from the normal uh, map, topographic map, to the 16th century map. So people could, again, uh, go back and uh, in time and in place and then see where they are in the medieval or 16th century landscape. Then finally, also, this has a second part, a roadmap. The different meaning, the other meaning of roadmap, a roadmap towards something, eh? towards a more sustainable uh, coastal area in this case. We're uh, now into a new project. Eh? This is the Belgian coast. We have only 60 kilometers of coast, of which half of it is fully built, like that one with skyscrapers. Lots of problems with erosion, as you can see here, but also in the coming decades, centuries, there will be lots of problems with uh, sea, sea level rise. And so that's why uh, we are in blue balance with this project. And the idea is to increase public engagements in the, situ in the sustainable transition of the coastal plain. And how do we do this? By assessing the optimal, optimal methods to engage uh, stakeholders for participatory processes. For example, Colleagues of mine, communication experts and environmental sociologists are now doing a survey on the whole coastal population, both tourists and, uh, and, and residents, on the underlying drivers that influence whether they support or not support coastal change in general. And they will compare this with a survey on the AR and VR uh, methods, the communication methods that we, that we uh, made in the previous project, and then see what's the impact of this communication and uh, on the historical time depth. And then coming from this research, we will select five sites. That's my job in this, uh, in this project. Philip select five sites where we will develop uh, a blueprint for new communication actions, uh, so to speak, starting from or all, all, all based at uh, heritage sites covering the whole coastal area. 
And of course, I'm now making a long list, but the map is of course also featuring in this long list. The idea is that we would um, have all the lines and points that I made in the vectorization. They're empty, uh, so to speak, but to complete them with historical landscape, archeological data and make a giant geo database of the coastal area around uh, 1600, uh, also using a lot of uh, public participation, like a mapathon, hackathon kind of thing. So, to conclude, I hope this presentation uh, showed that through the various ways of reconsuming and reusing this map, we're not only studying the past landscape, we're also putting into practice for uh, public uh, heritage management of heritage management at the present, and also think about it, how it how the map can provide landscape uh, affection, can provide sense of place, can pr provide sense um, time depth also for uh, uh, thinking about the future landscapes. And then I would end with uh, thanking of and acknowledging all the persons that in these various projects, that this is three projects over 10 years, more or less, that uh, are collaborated in this, uh, all of these projects. Thank you. Oh, thank you so much, Dr. Trache. That was absolutely stunning. I never realized how important physical fitness was going to be for um, uh, conducting this kind of research. Uh, wonderful, wonderful stuff. Um, Thank you.